Well, I am really excited about you meeting uh, what's I want to say a good friend because but we just don't really know each other real well. But I feel like we have been friends for a long time. This is Pat Bradley from Crisis Aid, and in February, Laura and I were in Ethiopia and East East Africa region is where you guys do your work in East Africa, that whole area there. And so when when we were when we were over there uh, this past year. In February, like I said, um, we we met Pat, and really it was a transformational moment for Laura and I, as you took us down there on that red light district that night. I don't even know how to describe what it was like, but I want to back up a step here, and before we get into that, um, just first of all, just tell. Tell everybody a little bit of your story, of your background, because I think it's so important to people to know that um, this is not like a, you're a missionary and you have, you know, and you're in full-time ministry. You're, you're a businessman. Yeah. So talk about that. That's very true. Yes. I wanted to, um, my background really is this. I was an alcoholic. My wife divorced me and I was about a step away from living under the bridge. And that's when God got a hold of my life and got a hold of my attention, um, Long, long story short, gave my life to Christ. He re, he, uh, my wife and I got remarried. And when we got remarried, God put a really, uh, just a burden in our heart to help others, especially in missions and foreign missions. And that's what was the birth of crisis aid. So, I mean, I am just like anybody that's sitting in the church. I'm like anybody that's walking down the street or your coworkers. I am not a special person in any way, shape or form. I'm just an ordinary person. Yeah. That would just, Everything we're talking about today is God using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Now, crisis aid, um, we've, we're talking um, specifically, we've talked a lot about sex trafficking, but mm -hmm. crisis aid does so much work. Can you just give us that, I mean, in your, your one-minute synopsis, this is going to be hard for you, but uh, on the, the broad stroke of what Crisis Aid does and the ministry and the work that you guys are doing. Sure. I mean, really what Crisis Aid does is we rescue families and, and um, children from life and death situations, and we rescue girls out of sexual slavery. And our, our vision is very simple. It's, it's we exist to rescue or to save lives, save souls, and change futures. So everything we do fits underneath that. We have water projects, education projects. We've built pediatric hospitals. We're opening a second pediatric hospital. Um, sex trafficking work here in the States, as well as in East Africa. We have large scale feeding programs in areas where children today, today children are going to die because they don't have enough food to eat. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about that. Hopefully we have enough time to talk about that because yeah. I think it's fascinating the work you're doing there. But let's, for, for people who have, have a dream that God's put in them, and they're like, I, I, I'd like to do something, but man, you're, I could never be Pat Bradley. I would love for you to sh share with them. Um, to date, it's, I thought it was over 600 uh, girls that you have rescued. That's just in that one area um, of East Africa. But collectively, over 1,400 girls since, how, how many years now? Of doing oh, wow, we started in 2007. And so tell the first girl we rescued was in 2007. I want you to tell that story because it's just overwhelming. Like, how would I ever rescue 1,400 girls? And it, it always starts with one. Uh, yeah. t tell us that story about when you get off the plane and, and you ended up going down there and meeting that, that girl. Sure. We were in a, a large city in East Africa, and we were talking to a man and had a ministry to street children. And so we were talking to him, and... and I just felt this prompting to, from God to say, ask him about prostitution. And so I did. I said, hey, can you tell me about prostitution? And this was like in the middle of what he's explaining about what he's doing. And uh, so he tells me about this red light district and tells me how big it is and what it's like. And, and uh, next thing I said was, well, can you take us there tonight? And he said, sure, we'll go down there. And so um, I went back to my hotel and called my wife and said, hey, we're, she goes, what are you doing? I go, oh, we're going to go hang out with the prostitutes tonight. <laughs> she's like, excuse me, what did you just tell me? I'm like, you, she's like, that's an interesting thing to say yeah. when you're on the other side of the world. <laughs> and, to uh, your wife. <laughs> to my wife. But um, so anyway, long story short, we went down there that night. And when we got out of, uh, we were in a van, we got out and we start walking up and down these alleys. And I, I can describe it like this. I heard someone describe that red light district like this. That's what the world would look like if there was no God. 
it's literally hell. It smells. There's sewage. There's no hope. It's a very hopeless situation. Uh, I've been there. Place you've been you, there. You took me. You know what it's like. And I would absolutely describe if that's that's hell. Mm-hmm. That's hell on this only, only way. It is evil at, in its worst form, and you can feel the demonic presence. You can see that where is where is God? And but then, yeah. but God always enters into those places through people like you. That, yeah, I mean that's what God wants. <laughs> yeah, and so anyway. We walked up to this group of five girls and we struck up this conversation. We had, you know, an interpreter with us and, and we, it was kind of people like looking at us because we were just the only Caucasian people there. And so they invited us into the room and as I was going into the room, I turned around and looked over my shoulder and I saw this one young girl walking down the alley. And I said something, I said, hey, talk to her, see if she wants to come. And so she came in, she didn't know the other girls. So now these are all girls that are sex slaves. That's literally what they are. And so, but there was girl number six who no one knew. And so as we're talking to him, and our message was really simple. It was like, I didn't know what I was going to say to him. So what comes out of my mouth was, you know what? God has a better plan for your life than this. Are you interested in hearing it? And they said, sure. And so we kind of talked about this and that. And, and then, uh, and it was a short conversation. And we talked about receiving Jesus. And they all said, yes, I want to receive Jesus. So we prayed and led them to Christ. But as we got done, it was like there was my uh, attention was focused on this one single girl. And I, so I start talking to her. And I, honestly, I don't remember what we were talking about. But I heard the voice of God say, baptize her. I'm like, wow. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah I, that that was I mean, must, it wasn't me. Yeah. I'd, so I kind of ignored it, and about a minute later, I heard again, "Baptizer now." So I'm like, "Okay, hey, we're, we're, they want God wants us to baptize her, but there's no running water there." Right. So we sent somebody out with a pot. They came back with water, and we went outside, and I had her bend over, and I poured this water over her head, and and I'm you know I'm like not knowing what to say. I've never baptized anyone, and I'm doing this, and I'm going, I sure hope this is taking, you know. And then, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I thought I had that part right, and so she stood up. <laughs> she stood up, and Pastor, when she stood up, this glow came out of her, and the smile that was never there, she smiled that from the depths of her being. It was like God was just coming out of her. And I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, we can't just stop here. And so I said, would you like to leave tonight? Is it safe for you to come with us tonight? And she said, yes, my owner is not here tonight. I'm like, oh, wow, your owner? You wow. think of someone as your owner? And so she said, yes. And so I said, well, go get everything, you know, go get your stuff and come back. So like 10 minutes later, she came back with a shopping bag, like a Walmart bag, you know? Yeah, yeah. All of her worldly possessions fit in that bag. And I learned something. She was 16 years old, and she'd been there five years, and she had no family. Five years in that living hell. She's sixteen. So that's you gotta let that. Yeah. As you tell me a story again, I've heard this story several times. She was. She's eleven years old. Yeah, eleven. Man. Yeah. Raped repeatedly, 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 day in, day out, day every day, three hundred sixty-five days a year. That's where she lived. You talk about not having hope or a hopeless place or a hopeless situation. That is it. And and. uh and so she came, and she came back, and there, here she comes with that smile, and it was like she just lit up the whole area from that smile. And we're, we're walking out, and I remember thinking, what in the world am I going to do with her? <laughs> <laughs> I had no plan. I had no idea. This is so great, though. This is what we, <laughs> we need to hear this. This is like you just, all you did was say yes, yeah. and then you go, I don't know. <laughs> And th- but that's what God's looking for. I believe so, yeah. And all of us are so, I'm sorry I'm interrupting here, but I nope. just think this is so big. Is like, I know I'm, I'm like, okay, God, show me the plan, and then I'll do it. And God's like, the plan is ask her if she wants to leave tonight. <laughs> yeah. And, okay, so this is so fan- yeah. fascinating. So we're walking back to the car, and I'm thinking to myself, where are we going to take her? What are we going to do with her? I have no clue what this is. What's the next step? Wow. And so we got her in the car, and we, we, uh, we, arranged that she could spend the next couple of nights in with this guy's in his office that had that ministry to his three children. So the next morning, we're like, okay, let's find her a small apartment, put her in the small apartment, and uh, we'll see where we're going. But 
um, as we're doing this, you know, I'm telling her, well, we're, we're going to develop a new program here. We're going to give you a chance for a brand new life, provide you with education, provide you with vocational skills. And, you know, I'm, and again, I'm this not, is less than 24 hours. You didn't even know about it 24 hours before this. Oh, and I didn't now know about you're it telling half an hour this, before that. <laughs> I'm telling so, her what we're going to do. Yeah, this is what we're going to do. Uh -huh. but you, but again, you don't have a plan. You're nope. just like. But this is what we are going to do. It is, yeah. No plan. Now this is what we're going to do, and and uh, and so she was happy. And so we had to leave the next day, so we left. And that was in December, and I came back in January, and we happened to rescue our second girl. And then I was back in March, and we rescued three more. And so by the end of March, we had seven girls in different apartments, and I was like, "This isn't going to work. We need to come up with a different plan." And so, and naturally during that time, we were planning what we were doing with the vocational school and getting the girls. Uh, you know, so that they could have an education, at least a high school education. And so at that point in time, we um, were able to rent our, our first home and move them all into one home and started our work in the sex trafficking rescue. <laughs> and then is it this the same girl that you rescued or is it a different girl? We have a picture of you at a wedding. Tell us sure. that story. Sure. The girl uh, that's on a picture, the shorter one, that's the very first girl that we rescued. And so... Um, Wow. She got married, and actually, on her wedding day, three out of the first seven, three of the girls got married together all in one service, all in the same day, and they had asked our wife, my wife and I to be their parents to give them away. And so that was like the honor of honors to be able to walk them down an aisle. And, and so we've had that privilege. All because you got off a plane and said, so take me down to where this prostitution is taking place. Yeah. You took us down there, Laura and I, and I... One thing I'm never going to forget is when you said, oh, that bus station over there. So the girls come out of the villages and their parents send them to get jobs. And then the, there's a man waiting saying, oh, I'll give you a job and hands them money. And then he owns that yeah. child. Yep, pretty much. And the then they case. walk across the street to these shanties that are lined up 15 feet by five, maybe not even that big, 10 by five. Yeah. Has a bed, bed in it. It's... It's the most horrific, evil thing I have ever seen on this planet. And so then in that particular area, um, girls, what are some of the vocational things that they're learning? Because I know there's a vocational school. Girls are actually graduating from this yes. school. Yes. Like, what yes, what yes. is this? So we, we had about eight homes going, and our vision is to rescue 15,000 girls. And so we just picked a number out of the air. Let's say 15,000. Okay, God, we went 15,000. What do we need to do? We had eight homes. Uh, rents were going up in the city and was getting very expensive. And I was like, we're never going to get 15000 this way. What else? What more? What different? Let's think. Of, let's ask a better question. Mm -hmm. um, and so we came up with the idea, well, we need to have a vocational school to teach the girls in a red light district a trade, a vocation where they can go out and get a job in their local village or there tomorrow. Not some, not, you know, like making things that will, that you can like we would have to export in oh, okay. to the states and so right. I wanted them to have a, a, a training and a job where they could go and get it tomorrow so we got hairdressing we've got um, weaving computer skills uh, we got a forget. picture of one of the girls that's a hairdresser yeah, yeah there it is yeah, yeah yes. so that that beautiful late look how beautiful look how beautiful yes the restoration and the beauty of that man so, so that girl was one of the like first 15 girls that we rescued and now many years later she's been through our program um she works with the girls now in the red light district but uh she has her own shop and she employs several of the girls that have graduated from mercy chapel so the cool thing about mercy chapel it's like of all the things we did it's my favorite project because we actually bought a brothel in the middle of the red light district and that's become the vocational training school, the ch a church, and a counseling center, right in the middle of that you place. Bought the brothel, yeah. Repurposed it yeah. for God's glory. Yes, that is to me, like it, okay. So if you're brand new to church, or maybe you've not been in church for a long time, and you're watching today, and you're like, "Who is Jesus?" <laughs> this is exactly who Jesus is. He takes the worst of atrocities, the worst of injustice. And he not only repurposes it, not only does he restore it, but he makes it brand new. Yes. And turns it into something completely different. Yes. Like that's a, such a picture of what he does, even in our lives. So now over 1,400 girls, and we could talk and tell stories like for hours, but we just don't <laughs> have that kind of time. 
But one thing I want to make sure I get said, because I want to, I, hopefully we're going to have enough time to talk about a couple, one of the other things you're doing. But I want to get to something I think is really, really important. You and I last night at dinner were talking about this, is the power, the most powerful word in the English vocabulary. And, and you said that word is yes. Yes, yes. And so the first girl that you saw up there in a wedding gown, she, gave, she came out, and she, when I asked her, are you ready to leave? She said yes. And what happened, what birthed from that word, from that answer, was uh, launched us into a whole new area of ministry of, of rescuing girls out of red light districts and rescuing and, um, and sex trafficking. It's led to, like you said, 1,400 girls. We've had homes in Cambodia. We had a home in Cambodia for two years. Our assigned age group was 4 to 12 years old. When we opened that home, we had 27 girls in that age range. And you told me when you when you started this, the word sex trafficking didn't even exist. No, it did not exist. In fact, we referred to it as forced prostitution. Um, and later on, after meetings with the FBI here in the United States about opening homes here in the States, um, at that point, it was like four years later, still the word sex trafficking did not exist. Mm. And so it was very early on um, in... So I, really, to sum it up, that girl's yes turned into a movement that's become global, that's gotten a lot of attention, and t you know, tens of thousands and thousands of girls through other organizations now have been rescued and redeemed and set free from a life of absolute hell because that one girl said yes. Mm -hmm. And I believe Also that. because you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know you're one of the most humble guys, and you, know, you just kind of push it off of you, but it's so important because one of the things you said to me last night is, like, God has got all these things he wants to do. He's like, I want to do all these things. Will somebody just say yes? Yeah. Will somebody just say yes? Yeah. I, and, I, and, you know, and then I do believe that because it's like, um, you know, I meet a lot of uh, believers who will say, hey, I'm just waiting to hear the will of God. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? All right, I, this is one I really like. I'm, like I, I'm waiting for God to turn the light green. Well, why don't you change your perspective and assume that the light is green and step out and see what God will, God will use you to do? It's, it's like, you know, the word says, the, in Psalm that says, if, um, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. Mm -hmm. And so what's in your heart? Mm -hmm. You know, follow your heart. It's okay to follow your heart because that desire is what God put there. And so step out and see what happens. I think one of the things... Um, we've got just a couple of minutes here, but, and I don't know how much you want to say about this from what you said so raw last night, but I want to kind of give you permission to talk to us, um, as a church, the church in America, but specifically to the people of core church. Uh, I'm okay with you kind of taking us out behind the woodshed a little bit, uh, <laughs> which is what I, I in, a, in a good way, in a good way, but I think your holy discontent um, towards what's happening in our world and how so many of us and so many people in the church are complacent. I don't know what you want to say about that, but I want to give you permission to say whatever God okay. tells you to say oh or whatever boy. Pat wants to say. <laughs> um, you know, really what I want to do is I want to encourage people. Um, God has a great plan for your life, and you have a lot more to do with that plan than you think you do because it's not about sitting back and waiting for God to give you revelation. God has already given us the revelation. It's those things in our heart. Let me ask you this question. If you had all the money in the world, here's a good way to figure out what God's desire in your heart is. If you have all the money in the world and you don't need to work, and you really do love God, what would you do? If money wasn't an object, what would you do? What would you attempt to do? Or what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Those are the things that God put in your heart. Those are the things that become the destiny of your, uh, destiny of your life that's going to affect the next generation and generations after that. Because our lives matter. Your life matters. Do you realize that your life matters and it will affect eternity, where people and how people will uh, spend eternity? But not only that, how they spend the rest of their days here on this earth. And I'm not saying that maybe... You know, God sent us to, you know, it started in the Sudan and in other countries. You know, that was what God did with me. But it takes a lot of people behind me to make all of that possible. Like, you're seeing me and you're seeing Christ as saved, but there's a whole lot of people behind me that God has gifted and anointed and put a desire in their heart to come and serve. And so there's a lot of us out there. And you know what? 
think about this. We serve the God who created the universe. You know, just look up, you see the sun, the stars. I mean, stop for a second and think about this. You look at Mount Everest and the majestic thing of Mount Everest, then look at a butterfly and how delicate that is and the colors and everything. That God, the God that created all of that, created you, and he gave you a purpose. And you know what? Serving God should be the greatest adventure on the planet as a Christian because we're serving that God that, did, that made all of that, and he's like saying, you want to change people's eternity? I need you to help me change the eternity where people are going to. God cannot do it outside of our willingness to come alongside and say, Lord, whatever you want. You know, just think about it like this. We have a saying with crisis aid. We refuse to do nothing, and giving up is not an option. It never was, and it never will be. And so I just want to encourage you to stop for a minute and go, you know what? All I need to do is say, yes, Lord. And then whatever you find in your heart, follow it. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to find God's plan for your life. That I promise you. That's it. I mean, uh, uh, so much more I want to talk about. And we had so many things that we want to talk about. We just don't have the time to do it. But that's what we needed to hear today. And that's what I, I needed to hear today. We sometimes, as followers of Jesus, we, we just, I mean, it's understandable. God, you're like, the God of the universe. How do I figure out the God of the universe? You can't. You never, you never will. He sees, he's, uh, you know, you, you're not fully ever going to understand all that God is. But we overcomplicate it. And what I have loved about your story and just meeting you and becoming friends with you is you have just made it simplistic. Just. Just say yes and do the next thing and then watch what God does. Amen. You know, and I want to say this one last thing is that I don't believe God chose me to do what I'm doing because of my strengths. I think he chose me to do, to do what I'm doing because of my weaknesses. Because of my weakness, I must depend on him. Yeah. What I want to circle back around to, we want to pray for you this morning and your ministry I want to pray for Sue. His wife is Sue, and she's at home in St. Louis. Uh, but I want to circle back around to this idea of um, you were an alcoholic. It cost you your marriage. Your life is devastated. It feels like you're not going to go anywhere. And maybe today that's how you're feeling. You're like, uh, <laughs> me? God would never use me. And I, and I hope that Pat's story has shown you uh, your, your story is the brothel story. Yeah. Is that what God did for you, you said, I'm going to do that for these girls. And I'm going to do that this for these orphans, for, the, for these children who are starving that we didn't have time to talk about. But you, I think some of what you do is you look into them and you see yourself. And, you're, and you see what God did for you. And this is what God can do for you. So I want to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I, I just pray for those that are watching right now and you're birthing something in them and you're asking for their yes, that you give them the power to say yes. Just right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, stop right now. Say yes. Yes, God. So I'll pick up the phone. I'll make the phone call or I'll go across the street. I'll... I'll stop here. I'll send that email. I'll, I'll go to that place. Okay, God. Yes, I'm just going to do it. And wherever you lead, wherever that ends up, I'm in. And Father, we thank you for Pat, and we thank you for just the restoration that you've done first and foremost in him. That you have made all things new in his life. Thank you for the inspiration that he is giving to so many people here with us but all over the globe we pray for crisis aid these children right now there's um there's a young girl and she's getting off a bus and somebody right there is not the right one and may god you place men and women and rise us up out of the seats so that we are the ones that meet these children at the bus stops all over this world, wherever that is. 
before the evil and the atrocities can even touch them, God. Would you raise up your church to step into the gap and to be Jesus? I pray for blessing upon crisis aid. I pray for favor upon them. I pray for strength for Pat for what he is doing in the work before him. In Jesus' name, amen.